is the uh, agenda that we'll go through tonight. Let me know when you guys can see. Um, there are some places that we might stop and do some whiteboarding uh, and a couple of questions to have you guys think about what we've talked about before and apply it uh, in a couple situations. And then we're going to stay afterwards. I'm not going to uh, record the whiteboarding into this uh, direct document, um, but uh, I'll probably record a second one and you guys can sit there and ask questions all night or we can go fly or whatever you want to do. Um, but basically what we're going to talk about here in the slide deck are uh, for the basic training course, the people, the weapons, and the radar, and then the teamwork, how we intend for you to employ the aircraft at a basic level, and then we're going to go through a scenario uh, that, that I've shown from multiple angles so you can see uh, how both the pilot and the Rio are seeing a typical employment basic engagement. So just following the basic standard operating procedure and employing. There's also an appendix with control bindings, uh, other different recommendations and charts that you guys might find useful. So with that, we'll go ahead and start. So uh, for those of you that have followed this last year, um, there are some significant changes to these slides, and they're driven from a few different uh, major items. The first are the CFD flight model changes for the AIM-54 that came out about four months ago. Um, we do almost continuous post-patch missile testing in the 40th. Uh, myself and a few other people are involved. So anytime a change in the API happens, the physics model, radar performance, chaff, jamming, whatever, uh, I go out and I shoot hundreds of weapons in controlled situations, plug data into machine learning models and try and learn about it. Uh, it's really fascinating. Um, it's geared towards both AI and PVP usages because they are different. And we do it for the 54 family, the 120, and the SD-10, which are the primary 40th SOC weapons. Um, there have been changes in how the AUG-9 works and how it performs, as well as the switches in functionality in the past year. There was a flight model change uh, in June of 2021 that had some significant impacts. And there's been a lot of AI defensive logic changes late last year, as well as a jamming effects implementation and the combination of all the above has significantly changed our recommendations on basic Tomcat usage. Um, so that's why I kind of wanted to run this class again, and I plan on doing it once each year uh, with whatever updates may occur during that time frame. Uh, we've also had a ton of input from collaborators. Uh, here's the list for 2021. Some of you guys are in this room, uh, some aren't. So uh, cream and vapor, I mean, these are guys I'm constantly going to to see if, you know, first of all, are these training methods going to be acceptable and scalable? Do they fit what the squad goals are? Are they realistic to roll out in, in an easy way? Uh, I also have significant discussions post-patch with Karen, who's the owner of flyandwire.com. I highly recommend if you're a Tomcat geek to go look at all the tremendous amount of articles he's put out. They're kind of high level. I'd say go through this training first and then maybe read these over the summer, but it does a great job on the technical button pushing, configuration, stuff like that. Not necessarily tactics, uh, but we have an open data exchange and discussions. Um, I do the same with SPQR Alpha Gator. Um, for the 2021 SATAL season, was probably the most successful Tomcat pilot in SATAL. I work as an adversary with them from time to time and uh, an SME with the missile uh, data logic. And we kind of share information and tact views from time to time. Uh, Dormouse, you may have seen him on the F-14 forums. Uh, he's a constant, uh, also a, a PVP SATAL guy, but he's really good at looking at bugs and things like that. And I try and contribute and help them test the doubts of the community, like does the AIM-54 give guidance warnings uh, that the RWR doesn't see, or uh, can it be shot and fired without uh, giving any smoke or indication, and, and we work on those together to determine if they're right or wrong. And some of those results helped overturn the ban of the F-14 in SATAL, because uh, there was a lot of fake information running around. Uh, and finally, the two BFM guys, uh, Loblo and Sungho, who are multiple uh, European Folds of Honor, uh, DARPA Viper Killer champions, uh, really helping kick my ass a lot. And that's why I try and hand down that to you guys so that we can all kick each other's ass in, in BFM. 
There's a lot of guides here. I'm not going to go through this list. You can check it out in your own time, but I highly recommend the videos from all these sources, uh, especially RedKite. Um, so if you're trying to learn how to start it up, what buttons to turn, how to align the INS or something, just go look at these. Also as a pilot, refueling and stuff like that. So what are the goals of this session? Uh, we're going to try and teach you how to be coordinated and dangerous, how to come home alive, and how to partner with your buddies as a unit by following a basic SOP. This session, we are not talking about advanced tactics. We're not talking about making you the best guy possible. We just want to make you like an army of spearmen. Everybody's deadly. You could have started as a peasant, but you know what? With 50 of you lined up next to each other doing the exact same thing, it's going to be an effective strategy, and it's simple to implement. Um, we don't teach real-life tactics and procedures because this isn't real life. We'll go over that uh, in these sessions. And we're not going to provide strict rules. These things can be adjusted to situations. They can be adjusted when patches change. And we're also not going to teach you basic startup and button pushing. There's plenty of guides that are linked. Uh, we basically want to be DCS Tomcat for dummies um, and change you from this lovely vapor-like uh, avatar in the center to this one on the left. So get to grow up and be, be a deadly system. So speaking about the people and the people system, uh, you got two people in this jet. Um, there are very few modules that have true multi-crew, and the DCSF-14 is one of the most unique because the overlap between these two people is minimal. There are lots of things that the guy in the front can do that the one in the back can't do, and vice versa. It's a team effort. Uh, both people are one machine, and it actually doesn't matter if the person in the back is Jester or a human. you got to think of Jester as a human, because the tactics that you employ are going to take advantage of this situation with these two uh, pieces of the machine moving in concert. Um, the Rio does not work for the pilot. He's not your R2-D2 or your bitch. Uh, he has things to contribute, and he also shouldn't be riding along like the pilot is his taxi. Um, it is an equal playing field, and there's lots of stuff for both people to do all the time. So you've got split responsibilities. They evolve in every phase of flight. Uh, you're both allowed to talk on the radio, um, and there's lots of things that you can improve on. And that's part of the reason why this module is so rewarding is because it scales. The more time you spend with it, the more stuff you learn. It goes really high. Now, real life versus DCS. Um, in real life, a pilot and Rio are paired together. They spend equal time in the plane. They always train together. And if one or the other fails, their career and their life is on the line together. This doesn't happen in DCS. Uh, we are a lot more like a commercial airline. Any pilot can be mixed with any Rio. People can switch jobs. They don't always show up. Sometimes the pilot has to fly by himself. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why we're mixed, and this is why standard operating procedures are far more important than what you see in real life, where you're talking about team improvement. So raising the floor is actually better than trying to make elite teams, because making elite teams means that you can't fly on a Saturday if your buddy doesn't show up, and that kind of sucks. So the pilot needs to understand all the roles. We encourage pilots to Rio so that they can appreciate what goes on back there because it's the toughest role in this game. There's a lot to think about. Um, and we adjust the tactics so that they can be executed whether you have a Rio or not. So let's talk about some basic top level SOPs. And we'll have a few SOP slides in this. When it comes to air to air, uh, pilots have a variety of activities they need to perform, but it's no longer less than what Rios have to do. Uh, pilots need to be in air-to-air -air in charge of engagement situational awareness. Um, you need to make sure the physical positioning of the aircraft is advantageous to what you're trying to execute, the type of enemies, enemies you're seeing, and how you're going to employ weapons. And you're the primary employer of your primary defense, whether that's a kinetic defense, a countermeasure type, etc. Um, when you're flying air to ground with the lantern, the engagement essay is actually a little bit less important for you because the Rio is looking through the pod. What you need to be doing is, since that Rio is stuck with his head in the straw, you're trying to look for contrails, listen to tactical, and establish the tactical essay. And that's a key difference between air to air and air to ground in the Tomcat. 
uh, you're still in charge of physical positioning, you're still the one pushing the button, and you're still the one defending. Uh, but the key thing there is when you're air to ground, you're now the eyes out and tactical uh, overview person. For Rios, you've always got the weapons configuration, no matter if you're air to air or ground, there are multiple options you have available. And it's in charge uh, or in your responsibility to handle the countermeasure configuration. That doesn't just mean chaff and flare programs. It means which countermeasure you give to the pilot during each phase of engagement. And that's going to differ based on what that pilot has to do. And we'll talk about that in some future slides. Uh, in air to air, it's up to the Rio to help out with engagement SA, but more importantly, to maintain tactical SA. Because when you're focused on fighting a two ship in front of you, Who's paying attention to what's going on 80 miles away? Who's paying attention on where the strike package is? Where's the tanker? Did the boat move? What's happening on the ground? You got a second brain back there, and he's not looking at the bandit right now, so he can do that. Uh, he also is in charge of the alternative defense. So if you've handed the pilot the chaff for a VVR engagement, well, Rio's still got the flares. Uh, Rio can still employ chaff on his own if he sees a different threat. So you're always on point. Um, with the Lantern, obviously the Rio's providing the engagement essay on the target he's lasing and the designation. So, you know, there's a lot to do there. Um, you should never be bored in either seat. Um, and one joint responsibility for both people is you're both allowed to talk on the radio. Um, don't be silent as a Rio. You know, the pilot doesn't control the radio. Uh, both of you can talk as the plane. So Lance too. Doesn't matter if you're pilot or Rio. But if you say Lance 2R, you can tell everybody else, hey, I'm the Rio, and I'm talking right now. That's fine. The Rio sometimes has SA, the pilot doesn't. So you could say, hey, flight lead, Lance 2R, I see a bandit approaching 140 miles away. Great. Awesome. So next, let's talk about the weapon system. So there's four defining characteristics of the Tomcat. It uses missiles intercept long-range multiple targets with its long-range radar, and it does it fast. It was built for fleet defense way back in the Cold War, and similar to other Cold War designs like the A-10, it's been molded by pressures, business decisions, political nonsense, and so on, and it changed over time. But it has a few key strengths and weaknesses next to most of the fighters we typically engage in a 40th mission. Uh, long-range air-to-air punch, we have the longest reach out there. The speed that you have is only beaten by something like a MiG-31 or maybe a 29, but you still have more gas than he does. You've got longer range, you've got a high air-to-ground carry weight, and you've got a great radar for high and fast BVR. Where you're not so great is your medium and short-range missiles kind of suck. Uh, trying to deal with low targets and clutter is extremely difficult, and you don't have precise SA compared to something with an HSD like a Hornet or a Jeff or an A-10. Your nighttime WVR combat is significantly hindered because you don't have a Jehemix or a data link projected onto your helmet. And your FOX2, BFM, and ACM is a little bit weaker than aircraft with high off-boresight helmet targeted capability. And your gun's ACM, um, it used to be a really strong point of the aircraft, but it's become less, um, it's more equal now, but it's hard to employ, I guess is how I'd put it. And finally, your air to ground standoff range is very short. You're limited to LGBs, and so you have to be right over at target. So how do we take advantage of this? We have a few rules of thumb. We'll talk about these in future slides, but the first is we wanna get on profile. We wanna save our aircraft and use our advantages. We want to stay out of the wes of enemies. So when it comes to non-Tomcat opponents, why should you be within an R-27 range? You can punch longer than that. You're faster than most of those planes. You shouldn't be there. Just leave. So if you're up against a R-77, ET, R-73, just get the hell out of there. Let your wingman take care of it. Both of you are fast. You can reposition. There's no point to play the movie and try and merge and kill someone with a sidewinder if you have other alternatives. Uh, play to your strengths. How do we end up using the F-14 on a 40th mission night? Well, typically there's two roles that we see, long range air superiority and precision heavy strike. 
For those roles, we have a couple of different systems we use, the Mark 60 and Twiz Auto, the Lantern Pod and LGBs. Uh, again, you'll notice I didn't mention the Sidewinder Sparrow C model because you shouldn't be there. If you're in engagement range with those weapons, it probably means you screwed up or something bad happened or could be a million other things, but you should have options. We will talk about how to deal with these bad situations in the intermediate and advanced classes, but in terms of a basic SOP, just turn your burners and leave, right? Go save your aircraft, get more missiles, come back later. Next up, let's talk about the radar. There's three modes when we talk about employing most of the basic and intermediate SOPs for the Tomcat. Now, of course, it has a ton of other modes, but with the limitations in range in DCS, the type of missions we fly, and the fact we're not over open ocean, a lot of them don't really give any advantage that overdoes the advantages of these three. Uh, the first is range wall search. Um, by using super search, which is 160 degrees by eight bars, you can cover the entire airspace of the Tomcat's radar in six seconds. If you leave it on super search, now the Rio can do a lot of other things. Maybe run nav grid, maybe talk to tankers, maybe come up with an ingress egress plan. So instead of manually scanning the radar around and focusing your mind on this little piece of airspace, let this awesome system do the work. Find other places that you can advantageously apply your knowledge to build SA with the pilot, talk about engagement plans and other things. Uh, when you go to engage Twiz Auto, it's fantastic. Uh, it sorts targets for you, it does a good job at picking up uh, what's your nearest threat, and you can employ multiple weapons on it. Plus, the computer automatically handles the elevation and azimuth of the radar, so even if the pilot's violently maneuvering the aircraft, it'll keep it pointed in the right direction, as long as you don't exceed limits. Uh, some differences between RWS and Twiz Auto is RWS does not retain IFF information from the Rio to the pilot. You're just going to see a hit, and we'll show that on a later slide. Uh, Twiz Auto and the STT modes do retain IFF information. Uh, when it comes to STTs, the only real effective STT in the Tomcat is the Pulse. This is the shorter of the two ranges. It's good up to about 40 nautical miles. Uh, PD STT. Um, typically when you fly with Jester, as he switches from one to the other at about 35 miles, that's when you get the uh, famous, I lost lock. Not really his problem, it's an AUG-9 problem. AUG-9 wasn't meant to uh, transition that space between the two modes simply. Uh, you're supposed to use one or the other, and if you're inside a 40, uh, the PDSTT doesn't do a great job. So. Just use Pulse, you're almost never going to be shooting STT anyway. Uh, in the ACM modes, that's the mode that the ACM modes activate, so if you use pilot lock-on or vertical scan, it's technically a Pulse STT. And finally, your IFF button on the top right. You've got to hold it down, and it's the most important button you've got as a Rio uh, to make sure you don't kill friendlies. On your displays, um, your top display is where you're going to be looking for your IFF information. Um, when you hold the IFF button on a target that's seen in the radar, so here we've got four targets on the bottom, uh, the target that's friendly will have an equal sign superimposed over it. Um, you don't see the IFF directly on the TID on the bottom. That's your situational display. The Rio has to actually click on the target and assign friendly or hostile to it. So there's a few reasons that's important to think about. As the pilot, if your Rio hasn't marked them yet, you have no idea which one is the hostile. In this case, we got four airplanes. Only one is known as a friendly, and right now, only the Rio knows it's a friendly. So as a Rio, you gotta kinda stay on top of things and make sure you mark so that the pilot can see it in the front screen. Otherwise, he's basically blind. Uh, the other thing, too, is just like any other aircraft, just because it doesn't say friendly doesn't mean it's hostile. Correlate with your other sensors, like your RWR, to make a determination. What does the symbology look like on the TID? Kind of the most important things. Um, when you have a target that's just a radar hit, especially in RWS, you're going to have this little staple that just means it's a, a hit, it's not a hostile, it's not a friendly, and you can't retain it. Uh, in the RWS mode. 
in Twiz, you can assign either a caret or a uh, circle for hostile or friendly. Uh, symbology on the top of the hit is from your own ship, and symbology on the bottom is coming from the AWACS or the data link. On the left of the hit is a altitude in 10K increments. Remember how I said earlier in the disadvantages, you don't have precise SA. Is this plane at 10,001 feet? Or is it at 14,990 feet? You don't know, not with this screen. So that can be a big difference from time to time. Uh, one little cheater is that on the Tomcat TID, both the pilot and Rio, you have these dashes. So dash blank, dash blank. Each of those is always 20 miles, no matter what your zoom level. It's a nice little cheat to figure out how far away is somebody. A few other slides here I'll let you guys go back and reference on your own, just showing uh, on the bottom right targets that have been assigned from both the AWACS and the radar that they're hostile from own ship, as well as a target that the AWACS doesn't have, but the Rio has declared that it's hostile. Um, if you ever see these little uh, long tails, looks like little cat tails under a target, that is the launch zone probability of kill. If it's at the bottom, that means they're within the highest PK zone. If it's in the middle, it means it's a eh, 70% chance you'll probably kill them. And if it's at the top or not there at all, you're probably not within range yet. Uh, I don't encourage using the launch zone. It's not super accurate in the game, but if you do see it, that's what it means. Uh, also, whenever you have a target hooked, so if we look on the right uh, of the bottom right diagram, that one is highlighted. The hooked track will display various information on the top of the TID. So it's sometimes helpful as a pilot to see this hooked track and then see, ooh, ground speed, 270 knots. Magnetic heading of the target, 252. So this guy is going 270 knots and he's pointing 252 and flying that direction. Uh, these can vary, the Rio can set them in the back, we'll talk about it in a different class, but really helpful information that you can do for different engagements. On the pilot side, you can see he's got a repeat of the VDI on the bottom, uh, sorry, repeat of the TID on the bottom, and then he has the VDI on top, which basically uh, functions as his targeting display. Um, you actually don't need the HUD to do stuff in the F-14. You can fly with just these two and employ weapons. Um, and your range markers and steering cues, uh, steering cues probably the most important, are shown on the uh, VDI. So now we know a little bit about the weapons and the people. Uh, what sort of teamwork can we employ before we go to battle? Um, not going to go through these in great depth because you guys can do it on your own. Um, but just remember that even during takeoff, there's stuff that both the pilot and Rio can do. Right? Set up safety backstops, check-in destinations, uh, setting up radios, things like that. Same during navigation, establishing SA, Where's my tanker? Um, some key figures, though, on this slide. Your best endurance and climb speed is 0.7 Mach in military. And if you're really high uh, and you're over 30K, you get amazing efficiency at about 3.5K fuel burn on your fuel gauge. Uh, we'll show that in a later class, uh, along with a curve for cruising ranges and so on. Refueling. Again, watch the video, there's some tips here. Again, still stuff for the Rio to do. So if you're a Rio, you can help make this an easier activity for your pilot. Um, it's really helpful. And same with landing, there's stuff to do. So let's move on to, I think, what everybody's here for. Teamwork and battle. I'm a pilot, I'm a Rio. I wanna kill things. I wanna be ready for mission night this week. What do I train to? So there's a few basic SOPs for air to air. Um, we're gonna talk about a couple different categories here. Um, the first is radar control. If you're BVR, obviously it's the Rio. Nobody else has the side-to-side -side scan. They don't have the big screen. It's pretty obvious this is the radar operator's job. But once you get into within visual range, it usually transfers to the pilot, mainly because the PAL ACM mode is a much faster way to acquire something that's in a broad cone off your nose than to try and slew the radar around and get it. 
if you're really inside of like eight or 10 miles and you don't know where the bandit is, typically it's a lot more helpful for the Rio to stick his eyeballs out and start looking around and find the guy than to try and find him with the radar because you're searching with a tiny little cone at that tiny range. It's like looking around a basketball stadium with a flashlight that's dark. You're not going to find anything. It's just going to sneak up next to you. But if you just pull your eyes out, you probably see a missile trail, a flash of movement, a canopy reflection or something. Um, so what does that mean for eyeballs, right? Well, typically the person who has their eyeballs out is usually the opposite of whoever's controlling the radar. Um, when the pilot has the radar, obviously he's looking out, but the Rio's looking out too. Uh, when the Rio's got the radar, as a pilot, try to not just stare at your gauges, right? Get your eyeballs out. Trust that your Rio is going to build that SA for you and look for IR SAMs, look for landmarks, look for friendly units and contrails and things like that, even if you're VBR. For the TCS uh, as a Rio, it's super helpful to make sure you set it to narrow zoom and slave mode. This allows the television camera system to follow the radar and then you can use it on the VDI and the Rio display to help look at an enemy as he's coming towards you and determine has he launched a missile? What direction is he turning? Can I identify them? Is that a Syrian flag on the tail? Lots of different things. Uh, but really TCS in wide mode uh, based on how DCS renders things is not a very helpful mode, um, which is opposite of real life. Uh, for weapons config, we use the AIM-54 Mark 60. In the intermediate class, we will talk about why you should not use the C model or the A-47. Uh, we'll talk about that with data in that class, but for now, use a Mark 60, and the Rio should use the target size switch, and we'll talk about the setting in a slide down the way. And finally, uh, countermeasure configuration. Uh, really important for the Rio to set the type of countermeasure that the pilot has on hand and then also set up the DECM. Uh, because think about with a jammer, this is your DECM. Uh, in certain situations, it's valuable to have a jammer off. In other situations, it's valuable to have a jammer on. So what we'll do here really quick is let's, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know how you raise your hand, so I guess I'll be the first person to speak up. But uh, if you're BVR, uh, what sort of countermeasure do you think the pilot should have? And I guess I'll call on Sneak first. Let's say you're 40 uh, miles BVR. What what countermeasure should the pilot have under his finger? Oh, the pilot would have um, well, I, 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 in that instance, I typically entrust the Rio to deploy chaff. DVR, but I also, that's just how I've always said it. I haven't said it the other way. So. Okay. So uh, let me uh, try and sell a, a chaff argument for the pilot in this scenario. Yeah, um, sure. So if we're talking really long range BVR, your main threats will be missiles. Uh, and the Rio's typically, uh, he's head down, he's looking at other things. So my argument for the pilot having chaff, and again, this is an SOP that as you and your Rio, you can change based on who you trust, what you like. Uh, but if you don't have any other uh, preference, I'll recommend chaff. And the reason being is that uh, if a radar missile comes to you, the person who knows the most about when the aircraft is perfectly notched or defending is the guy flying it. So you take your defensive, and as you're notching, boom, 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 right under your finger, chaff, 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 chaff. That doesn't mean the Rio can't activate it. Of course, you could uh, have an SOP with your Rio that you set up uh, that's customized and say, hey, you know what? Uh, when I go into the defensive you know, and call chaff, you hit the button. Great. Or, hey, Rio, uh, you know, if you see a, a SAM come up, just automatically hit program two. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah. No, no wrong answer there. Um, but I, I, no, no, I you got a point. Yeah. I've always, like, in that instance, with the B, so I've been flying the A a lot more recently, mm -hmm. and it's allowed, it gives you the option of taking some of the, the task overload off the pilot because 
for lack of power. So I know in the in the B, and this is something that is, it's just like over the top nerdy. I don't ad, advertise this as being the only way to fly, but I'm very conscious at this point of finding the F-14 and trying to keep my my G uh, within acceptable parameters. So I've in in transitioning out of a BVR shot, like I'm very focused on instruments and then also uh, you know like speed gauges to know when I can start to make that aggressive turn out. But the chaff would be mm -hmm. something that would be useful as well. Usually I just when you said gesture to like I'm not advertising gesture either, but setting him, you go to countermeasures and then set it to uh there's that 12 o'clock setting. He's usually a lot more liberal about the way he yeah. dispenses chaff. So I have to change that over the mind. Yeah, have some experiments. I mean, again, kind of that reason I lean towards chaff is because as the pilot, I'm the guy. So if we look at our uh, scenario on the top right screen here, I'm you know, looking at a BVR guy 20 miles away. I can see that R27... R-77, SD-10, I can see them all come off the jet. Even even in Amram, you can see a faint little smoke trail this high. Right. So, yeah, being able to just immediately boom, 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 lots of chaff bundles as I go into the notch, it's pretty sweet to have that correlation and, and not have to ask the Rio to do anything. So give, give yeah. it a try. See how it works for you. I now, a good segue to what you're saying. Correction to getting it switched. Like, this is where I personally would mess up. Mm -hmm. I would neglect switching back over to chat or to flare <laughs> yeah, like if exactly. i a human a human rio would definitely do it but that's something i have a tendency to forget to turn off the jamming <laughs> which uh, i don't is that modeled correctly where you're within 40 miles and it makes you twice as big of a oh yeah yeah. yeah so yeah i always forget to turn that off on my own that's up my own fault yeah. by using gesture to turn it on but yeah, and that's actually a good segue into the third one I have listed, which is the J-11. So with the J-11, you have an aircraft that even BVR likes to look at you thermally, kind of like our ace last weekend. Uh, and even if he's going to employ a radar weapon, he likes to do it using his Erst. Uh, he also employs ETs. So for a J-11, you can make the argument that, you know what, I want the flares up front because I'm going to see that smoke. I'm going to assume it's either thermally sighted or a thermal guiding weapon, and I'm going to pull the idle and hit the flares out at the same time. So just think about uh, what I'm trying to get to here is think about the threat you're seeing, what they're going to try and hit you with, and if you're the eyes out guy, which in this case in A to A, it's the pilot, um, make sure you have the countermeasure that applies to the threat at that moment. Um, if you're BFMing with the guy, or Fox 2 now you want the flares for sure because the main thing he's going to try and hit you with is that 9X or that R73. Um, so as a Rio, when you're thinking about how this engagement's going and you're closing to the merge or you get chased down or something else, you got to really think about which, you know, which switch have you thrown? Is that decom still on? Is uh, the chaff or flare with the pilot? And make that decision for him because you can lower the workload. And then the two of you can do more as a unit. Uh, also, don't forget to tell him, if you're going to give him the chaff, tell him, you've got the chaff, music's on, you know, whatever else to keep that SA between the two of you up. So how does that play out in an example? So you're going to see a few slides where I mark the pilot with blue and the Rio with orange. And what we're trying to show here is what the person's doing at each step of the way. So in this case, the pilot's eyesight's on the bandit. So he's eye, eyes out. It's BVR. Uh, the Rio, meanwhile, is looking at his twiz. He's heads down. He's building SA both of the target. He's marking it hostile. He's deciding which countermeasure to help employ. Um, and the pilot is right now listening to GCI, and he's got his chaff ready for that R-77. So that's what he's thinking. Meanwhile, the Rio's talking, tactical stuff. Hey, lead, I'm too Rio. The bandit's flanking right. Here's his information. So both guys are, are fully engaged here. 
doing stuff, communications, establishing essay, and so on. Now in a BFM situation, things change a little bit. Sure, the pilot's eyes out, he's looking at the bandit, but you're probably twisting and turning, you're all over the sky. The pilot doesn't have a Jehemix, so he has no idea what speed he's going. He doesn't know what his fuel state is, and if he takes his eyes off the bandit to try and figure either of those things out, he might lose sight, and now the fight's over. Uh, he's also the one talking because he's got the relevant subject matter right now. So he's telling the radar or the Rio, hey, I'm taking the radar. I'm going pal and I'm offensive on this ballistic Viper. Meanwhile, the Rio's like, well, shit, I don't have a radar anymore. Pilot just took it from me. So what can I do? Well, I better start looking for his wingman and keep my finger on that flare and chaff switch. So I'm going to be eyes out looking over to the uh, across the circle behind the plane trying to find a second guy. It could even be knowing that there's a friendly, um, because if you're pushing guns against this Viper and the Rio sees that your wingman is right there with a heater, he, Rio can tell the pilot, hey, break off, man. Uh, number four has got a, a Fox 2 right now. He's got a shot. You know, don't be an Iceman, right? <laughs> Roll out of the way, let Maverick shoot. Or vice versa. Uh, meanwhile, of course, the Rio has a lot of time to look at the other gauges, so he tells the pilot, hey, you got the flares. He's calling the speed out to act like a little verbal Jehemix. And he's watching the fuel state. Hey, do we need to bug out? Where's the, which direction to the carrier? Those are all really valuable things that even in a tight guns fight, as a Rio, you can do to make this plane better than just a one pilot aircraft. Okay. So we've talked about kind of the teamwork aspect, some of the different things. How do we put all this to use in a simple engagement? Again, we want to take the strengths we have and we want to apply it in a way that dicks over the opponents, really. <laughs> it's the simplest way to put it. We don't want to give them any opportunity to use their strengths at all. So the first thing we talked about uh, in one of the early slides is getting on profile. What does on profile mean? It means that you're high. The target we're looking for for the optimal situation is 36,500 feet. I'll explain why in a second. But you want to be as high as you can be. It's your number one priority to be tall, especially if you're going to engage long range. Now, 36,500 is important because that's the beginning of the troposphere. It's where the atmosphere becomes significantly less dense which means missiles travel with less drag, planes go faster, um, and you can create an advantage over anybody that's lower and down in that thick air that has to shoot up towards you. The second priority is you want to be nose high. So even if you're a little bit slow, if you're high and nose up, you're going to toss that missile into a ballistic trajectory, and it's going to go through thin air. Not too bad. I mean, ballistic missiles use this technique and they start from an airspeed of zero and that works great. So you're kind of establishing the same thing. And your third priority is speed. Uh, there's almost no reason to be in combat in a Tomcat less than a speed of 0.85. I would say a bare minimum of 0.9 to start using your weapons on profile. Uh, you want to be full afterburner. So if you've established all three of these things, the plane is on profile. And the final activity is centering the T. So remember on the VDI, we, we showed that little T. Uh, that is the target centroid. What it means is of all the targets you've got in TWIZ, this is the optimal angle to get the best launch on all of them at once. Or if you only have one target, that target. So you want to center the T and pull the trigger. This is a completely on-profile scenario now. And by doing this, all these together versus just a level flight centered T, you're adding about 15 to 20% to your range. That's huge. In a grinder situation, that might be an extra one or two passes, depending on how fast your bandit is. Pretty amazing. Now, what does an on-profile range look like for the weapon system? Well, if you're at 36.5 on profile, um, you're going to fire a missile 
and it can go 70 miles, and when it shows up at 70 miles and flips its radar on to go active, it's still doing Mach 2. So your effective range to have a deadly missile when it shows up on your opponent's doorstep uh, is on profile about 70 miles. Now, you can see the lower we go, the thicker the air gets. And the AIM-54 is a big missile. It's not a slick, thin little AMRAM. It is a fat-looking truck, uh, mainly because it has to carry a lot of gas <laughs> to go as far as it needs to up high. But that really hurts it down low. And so you see the lower we go, the range really starts to fall off. Um, the orange is on a hot target. The blue is on a cold target. So the target's flying away from you for the blue. Now notice that if the target's flying away from you, even if you're on profile, your effective range is only still about 10 miles. So when people ask, when should I shoot the Phoenix? It depends a lot on what angle you're at, what angle the bandit's at, how fast is he, how fast are you? And so the next step, I'll talk about the actual recommended range of when I want you to pull the trigger to account for most situations. It's a lot less than the maximum. So on profile, if you really want a high probability of kill shot, you want to wait till about 35 minutes. A um, little bit lower at 20,000 feet, about 25. 10,000 feet, about 18. On the deck, about 10. Now, one thing of note is you'll notice that as we go lower, we're shooting a little bit closer to the maximum capability. Well, the reason for that is we're starting to get to the point where a standard AMRAM is going to be in range of you. So uh, on the deck, you actually want to shoot near maximum range because this AMRAM can go just as far if he's firing it at you or an R-77. So you actually pickle it off a little bit closer to the maximum to try and give that opponent something to think about. All right, so what does on profile mean for Rios? Not just a pilot thing. Rios have a lot to do. First off, huge recommendation here for most situations. Uh, and we'll talk more about the other situations in the other classes. But put your target size switch on large. Uh, it makes a larger pit bull cone. And so your missile is more likely to catch a fish in that basket when it arrives at its intercept. I'll explain that concept later. Just for now, trust me, switch it to large. You'll be a happy guy. You want to be IFFing, and you want to make sure that the TID range is set up to something that makes sense for the engagement, so your SA is really good. My general rule is just keep the targets away from the edges of the screen. Put a zoom level that sticks them somewhere in the middle, and that'll really help both you and the pilot maintain SA. Finally, there's some switches on the bottom left. Uh, actually, just leave them to the defaults. Uh, the defaults are highlighted here. And so all these things together makes a happy goose. So why do we go through all this? Again, we want the missiles to go through thin air. We want our SA to be as good as it can be. We want to fire using our advantages. And we want our target to have basically no options except leaving or dying. Simple as that. If you can force an enemy to go home because he's lost all his gas or he's so low he can't approach your SAMs or your strike package, that's almost as good as killing him. So, you know, that's really what you're there for. You're trying to keep people away from your AO or away from your strike package. So what does a typical attack look like from an employment perspective? There's a few different phases. Uh, this chart's called a BVR timeline. You can make one of these for any aircraft based on its ranges. You know, what's the range of the missile? What's your minimum abort range? Things like that. I purposely covered the ranges here because effective range, like I showed on the other slide, changes with every patch. It changes with every opponent. So it's not really important. What's important is knowing the stages of your attack. Uh, you can also use this with any other plane. You can fly an F-16 to this profile. You can fly a, you know, anything with a forward-facing weapon. So you got a few stages that you go through. And the standard style, uh, once you get to this decision point, uh, for us is called a skate. Now you have other options. We'll discuss the bonsai short skate and abort, as well as the recommit and grinders in the intermediate air to air. But let's just talk about one. And frankly, if you guys showed up this Saturday 
and you were able to execute this attack over and over again, everybody in the Lance squad would say, gosh darn it, I can rely on this guy. This is great. This is all you got to do. One plan. Things will work out all right for you. So you've got a commit phase, correlation phase, and employment, your escape. So let's see what this looks like in real life and how we might uh, use it in the future. This circle's a grinder. Um, forgot to take it out of the slide, but we'll talk about grinders in the next class. So pre-commit phase. What does it look like for a pilot? What does it look like for a Rio? So you can see we're in the pre-commit phase down here. Uh, this basically is where we don't know that there's any bad guys about. We're just doing our patrol. Everybody's looking around, looking at their TID, and you'll notice the Rio has his radar in super search, so he's covering a gigantic amount of airspace, 160 degrees by eight bars out to 200 miles. Gigantic little pizza pie he's covering. And blip, you have a, a hit. So these two SU-27s that are out there get picked up by super search, and now both these guys know about it. When you are deciding what to attack. So we've got our two targets that we picked up in RWS Super Search. Now we're gonna go and fight them. We're gonna switch to our on profile scenario. So we speed up, we gain altitude, and we try and get into on profile. So here we are, we're pretty close to our on profile altitude. We're fast, our nose is high, our T is centered. We're in twiz auto, the targets are in sight. We're getting ready to shoot. Next, we employ the weapon. So in this case, it's uh, two missiles going out in twiz mode towards the target. And because we have the nose up, the missiles are immediately lofting. They didn't need to waste energy and turn to climb. And they're heading off to their target. And immediately after we employ, see how the pattern breaks to the right? We're going to go into the crank. So the F-14 has some symbology that can really help you with the crank. Um, you look at your uh, VID as a pilot and you fly the little T, the centroid, to the limit of the display. So you see this donut? You can do any sort of evasive roll, you know, pitch movement, whatever, and you're going to fly that T to the outside and then level out. So here it was just a hard right crank. We level out, the T's on the left, and you can see the missiles arcing out, and we're in the crank. What does that look like from the Rio's perspective? Well, the Rio can tell you're getting close because the targets are getting way over to the left side of the display. The radar can't go any further to the left, and you can see the outer side of the scan cone is still a little bit there. There's some gap, but it's close. So as a Rio, when this starts to get close, it's helpful sometimes to call out, hey, pilot, gimbal, we're getting close to gimbal. Maybe the pilot's eyes out and can't see his T, but in this case, you know, both of them have good SA, and so the T is on the left side. We're at gimbal. Radar is still employed in a way that gives us SA towards who we're shooting at, and we can see what's going on. Now, remember this slide? Here we are. We've arrived here. You know, pilot's eyes are out. He's got chaff. Rio's head's down, and so on. Next stage is when the missiles go pit bull. So... The symbology on your radar screen uh, will tell you when the missile finally goes pit bull and tracks on its own. And what happens is the target that's pit bull will start pulsing and flashing on the screen, whereas the target that has a missile on it that's not pit bull yet remains a solid lit color. Um, you can see here as the front one started flashing, you can tell the missile's gone pit bull because the smoke has curved here of the motor firing. Um, meanwhile, pilot still eyes out, and we're still using TWIZ. Rio's still establishing SA, and the radar is still in its default aircraft stabilized mode. Eventually, both missiles go pit bull. So we're pit bull on the front guy and the back guy, um, and the Rio should be noticing, at least in the scenario I've got on screen here, remember our little cheaters on the range? Each dash is 20 miles. Well, this bottom 20-mile dash is kind of lined up with the nearest bandit as well. So we're now within when that SU-27 can shoot at us. 
So we need to get the heck out of here. So we turn to skate. So the technique is called skating. And we're going to be in turning away from the bandit, trying to notch. So when we're halfway, we're in the notch for a moment. We can dispense some chaff. And eventually we want to go totally cold so that we can use our speed to get away. We don't need to merge with these guys. We don't need to shoot sidewinders at them. We need to get the hell out and uh, come back another day. When you're in the skate and you've uh, maneuvered out of the limits of the radar, the Rio can turn a switch to what's called ground stabilized mode. And what that does is it changes the TID to be pointing up into the north. It gives you like a God's eye view um, of the situation. And it's kind of hard to see here, but there's a little pointy pin coming out of the center circle. That's the direction your aircraft is pointed in. And the reason it's helpful for the Rio to turn on this ground stab mode is that now the pilot can tell, even though the opponent is under his belly, right? He can't see these guys. He knows now he's in the perfect notch because he can see it on the TID. And now the pilot's hitting that button. He's pumping that chaff out in the notch. So switching to ground stab during the skate out is really helpful uh, to keep that SA. The other thing too is imagine there were more bandits in the area. Well, now that you're not guiding your missiles any longer, really helpful to see ground stab so you can see if other enemies are coming from different angles. Maybe you'll adjust the direction you're gonna run in. Uh, or maybe you're looking for your friendlies that are coming in to attack and flying in their direction. So ground stab's very helpful to see that. And finally, we're on the cold leg. Uh, you can still see on the ground stab that the bandits are perfectly behind us now and we're running away at full burner to gain range. Um, if you have data link, you can even tell when the missiles hit because the timer will count down to zero or less. And all, oftentimes you'll see the altitude decreasing as they you know, fall in pieces to the ground, things like that. Uh, of course, the pilot's concentrating on getting cold, making sure there's no more missiles coming. Um, he's talking to his flight you know, telling his wingman, hey, two is cold. I'm at 30,000, referencing 110. That's my you know, uh, direction I'm flying to get the hell out. And the Rio is on the second radio talking to tactical. Uh, Lance two, splash two flankers, northwest bullseye. So again, both of you guys can talk at the same time. It, you got two radios and two guys. You know, let people know what's going on. So that's really a, a standard employment and you can do this over and over with a wingman and kill multiple aircraft that never have a chance to shoot back at you and to be fair even if you just force a guy defensive over and over make them burn their gas waste their weapons on you and you run and go home and land on the boat that's a big win those aircraft did not spend their time tearing up our hornets tearing up our vipers shooting our a-10s you have done your job. You don't have to kill every bandit to be successful. What you need to do is deter them from your AO, deter them from your strike package. Now, what about Jester? Love him or hate him, he's a part of flying the Tomcat. There's always going to be aircraft without human Rios. But that said, every tactic on these slides can be flown with Jester. Every tactic on these slides can be done with the Jester wheel. I used to have a T16,000M joystick, and that's all I had, and I flew these profiles and killed lots of bandits and had a great time. There is a little bit of button foo to do it, but the nice thing about these tactics, doing high and fast and twiz auto, is that just the execution of shooting the missile doesn't take a lot of effort, right? The bigger portion is the SA management working with your wingman, and then having a human in the back just helps elevate that with future classes into more advanced tactics. But you can fly this one all the time. Now, is Jester better than the human? Sometimes. It's going to depend on a lot of things, and we'll talk about those in the intermediate. But just being in the back as a human doesn't mean you're more combat effective than Jester. If you follow the SOPs, you will be. And if you go and train and do the intermediate tactics, you will make decisions, execute them, and be way more effective than Jester. But 
you know, by no means does it mean you just say, I'm going to show up, I'm not going to train during the week or even during a month and expect to be useful. And, you know, it's a double-edged sword with the Tomcat. I'll always say there is nothing more fun in this game than two people in an F-14 that are competent, executing, destroying people in wreck and face. It is so good. I'm sure a lot of you that are up for doing the Apache are going to feel the same thing there. Executing with a hind, same thing. It's awesome. The problem is, is in those aircraft, the other seat can perform the flight task and the plane isn't totally inoperable if one or the other doesn't work. And unfortunately, the difficulty in the F-14 is that a team that doesn't work because they can't execute the SOP literally grounds the jet, makes it ineffective. So the whole point of this class is to make sure that we never have someone come out of a flight and say, God, I wish I would have taken Jester. That is the absolute failure of our culture and our training capabilities, and we can do better. On top of that, Lance is usually the cap for the AO, the primary. So not only is it your pilot and your, your Rio that you're letting down if you can't do the SOP, but it can be everybody else too. And so it's important that we, we do a good job and, and do this. And I'm willing to help. I will fly. I will Rio with you. There's plenty of people in this channel that will do that. Um, we want to make sure that we have an effective cap solution. So again, these tactics, basic SOP, works for all the Tomcats, A's and B's. It's easy to learn, easy to train. Uh, it works with humans and Jester. It's simple. Just learn you know, how to go in, sort, skate, use Twiz Auto, use the Mark 60, play the jet to its strengths. It's not hard to do. And you'll have a blast. You'll be smacking things left and right. Uh, and this provides a great foundation for us to go and talk about advanced tactics in the next class. So that's the end of my high horse for today. Um, I'm going to stick around here for you know, an hour-ish. Uh, if we want to go fly, if we want to talk individual tactics or something else, we can do that. But I just want to stay focused on the SOP as, as much as we can here because we will talk uh, skating, bonsaiing, BFM, things like that next week in the intermediate class. Okay, any questions on the basic? Oh, thank you, Hammer. That was freaking awesome, actually. Yeah, good presentation. Yeah, thanks, man.